Hello. The two most resounding successes of the British film industry in recent years have been Chariots of Fire and Gregory's Girl. Now the producer of Chariots, David Putnam, and the writer and director of Gregory's Girl, Bill Forsyth, have joined forces to make a new film, Local Hero, which stars Burt Lancaster. We followed this production through all its stages for tonight's programme, which is about Local Hero, of course, but it's also about the complex process of making a film. This involved the collaboration of many different individuals, but inevitably, the major characters in our story are Putnam and Forsyth. David Putnam moved into film production from advertising, and he's worked away vigorously producing British films for over ten years. His credits include That'll Be The Day, Bugsy Malone and Midnight Express, as well as Chariots, which of course won him a Best Film Oscar. Gregory's Girl was shot in Glasgow, where Bill Forsyth was born and grew up. He joined the film industry straight from school and worked for several years in documentaries. Local Hero is his third feature film. Most of it was shot on location in Scotland. What is it? Sorry to trouble you so early. We'd like to check in and maybe eat something. A breakfast isn't till eight. Seven in the fishing season. It's not the fishing season. We check in anyway. We've been on the road all night. We have an injured rabbit also. Never I believe innately, and this is the gut feeling, that there is a market for a gentle comedy and that hasn't been exploited. I, I can go further. I think what, what's happened is that Americans have redefined comedy ever since really blazing saddles. Comedy took a very specific direction and has continued down that road. So that comedy today, the word comedy, has become synonymous with kind of with zaniness. What we would have ten years ago described as zaniness has now become comedy. So I thought there was a, a, a gap. You know, that, that moving into a zanier and zanier areas had, I thought, created a gap for a gentle comedy. What, you know, the type of comedy I was brought up on. Putnam had already decided that Bill Forsyth would be the ideal person to write and direct such a comedy. An item in a newspaper provided them with the initial idea for a story. It was about an, an oil man, uh, or rather a Scots accountant, actually, who, in his part-time, had negotiated probably the best deal that the, that the British National Oil Corporation ever, ne ever negotiated. And it was just this weird idea that, and they used to have to break off negotiations while the members of his council, who were farmers, went off to milk the cows and everything else. And the idea of these Americans from, I think it was Texaco in that particular instance, having to sit around up in the Hebrides while the, while the people they were negotiating with went about their daily chores and then came back to the negotiating table, which was the village hall, I thought was a, a rich vein. And that's where we started. Once, <coughs> once I had the basic idea, I, I felt that there was enough for a film there. And as I say, that, that was a very simple idea. It was just the idea of a small community which suddenly was potentially very, very wealthy. You know, like a small community of maybe 50 people who suddenly were all millionaires overnight. That was the first thought. And, and uh, I began to think of old things on TV like the Beverly Hillbilly, stuff like that. So I thought there was, there was room for comic ideas inside that situation. Uh, so from there, it was just a matter of hard work, you know, knocking the story into shape. The story involves an American who comes from a very urban environment and the chances are he's the kind of person who actually hasn't got his feet wet on a beach before, you know, because I'm sure people like that do exist. He's maybe had his feet wet in a, in a swimming pool or, or somewhere in, in, in Houston, but, you know, actually tramping a beach and feeling grass under your feet, you know, that's a different matter. Uh, so I began to see, the, I began to think of the idea of this guy coming and 
finding himself in a completely natural situation. For instance, he can look up and see the stars, which is another thing that you can't do very readily in Houston. Uh, and so little kind of cosmic things began to kind of insinuate themselves into the story. And um, I became kind of interested in the idea of trying to make a film which was in some ways cosmic, was in some ways addressing itself to something, you know, beyond, but didn't involve uh, hardware like, um, you know, spaceships or, or, or little monsters or things like that, but actually just used things which are lying around the place, which, 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 uh, which are there, you know, in everyday life. Bill's natural filmmaking technique is to ramble, to investigate side waters and look at characters and uh, evaluate them and, and everything else. I think that's where his genius lies. Uh, where I was always trying to give the story, uh, and then what? Okay, and then what happens? And then what happens? So I was trying to give it, I think, was to narrative drive, and at the same time encompass what Bill's very special qualities. But I mean, he may. It's interesting to ask him the question. We've never discussed it, and he may say it quite differently. When you're working on a script, if if it's not taking shape, or if something, or if, if you're casting and something's not working, you need you, you need an impetus. You need a, a, a kind of driving force, and, and uh, I felt that very strongly from David. I knew that this particular tale, unless we went potty, couldn't cost more than really four million dollars. Well, I was immensely bullish about the whole thing. First of all, the cost of the film, and secondly, the, you know, Bill was now had heat behind him now as a result of uh, Gregory's Girl. I had Chariots of Fire out and released and I really did think it was going to be for once a real breeze to finance the picture. Wrong. <laughs> we were turned down everywhere. We could turn down rather shockingly, I still believe, by EMI. And I still don't quite understand why. I mean, they said it wasn't the sort of film they wanted to be making. And if you, whatever you can read into that, I'd be very grateful. Um, Rank were, I think, quite enthusiastic, just weren't prepared to put up that sort of money at all for any film. Not, not this picture. And we you know we did the round of the studios. The American studios looked at it slightly askance. I mean, it was a slight piece. And um, it wasn't financed at all. We had half the money from Goldcrest from the very beginning. It wasn't financed at all until actually the night of the British Academy Award. What did they say, all these people on both sides of the Atlantic who turned you down? What was the main thing they'd got against it? Too gentle. Lack of confrontation was one line that used to keep propping up that in fact everyone in the film is basically nice there isn't there are no unpleasant people in the picture and they felt that that you know, would give it a lack of uh, dynamic um, Bill's humor off the page is quite hard to read and you have to take it as an article of faith which you would because you've seen his films and I did because I'd seen his films but if you haven't then I suppose uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of quirky it reads quirky um, general as I say a, a kind of apathetic thing of of why couldn't you do Chariots too, and why isn't Bill doing Gregory's Girl Returns? That was the biggest single criticism. It was, this doesn't read like Gregory's Girl, or, you know, when you just had a terrific hit like Chariots, why aren't you making a more exhilarating story, they would say. Well, I would have said that if they, if they perceived the lack of dramatic confrontation and they were very perceptive, and they were probably more perceptive than I would have given them credit for, because that would, that's actually something that, which are, is inherent in the script as far as I'm concerned. With backing from Goldcrest, an independent British production company, finally fixed at two and a half million pounds, they could afford a nine-week shooting schedule. On the second week, they started filming at their main exterior location on the west coast of Scotland, where the unpredictable spring weather could cause expensive delays. We are shooting within a certain given set of parameters. I mean, it's not Reds or Heaven's Gate. We can't shoot on and on and on. Um, and I'd like to think that the budget, to an extent, is sacrosanct. It can't be so sacrosanct that if really silly things start happening with the weather or, uh, or other uninsurable accidents occur, uh, obviously the budget's got to give. But I think that while things are going well and while units working well, the budget does create the, uh, the parameters and we are honour-bound as well as contractually bound to work within them. You budget on screen time, really, and at the moment we're ahead. We're, we're averaging over three minutes a day of screen time. It took six months to find the right location for the beach scenes, but even then there were problems. Each day, the entire cast and crew had to be driven 40 miles from the nearest hotels in Fort William. This involved the daily loss of two hours shooting time on top of the considerable transport costs. Well, I mean, it, it is a stretch, and as I was saying earlier, it's not entirely uh, convenient to drive 40 miles from your base to a, an important location, one that you're using for almost a, well, for over a week. Um, but the story very, very much depends for its credibility on the notion that uh, here is a part of the world, on a particular beach, where the, uh, the idea of building a re refinery uh, is 
patently unthinkable. And it's important that the audience believe that, you know, and the audience, when they see it, have the same feeling that the uh, protagonists have. We're getting value for money for it because I think the location is unique and, and quite extraordinary. And it's one of the elements that's going to make the film have scale. The beauty of this beach is vital to the story of Local Hero. The audience must believe in its power to seduce the slick American executive McIntyre and transform him into a scruffy beachcomber. If the atmosphere of the location was to come across on the screen, it was important that it should be felt by the cast and crew making the film. Any time someone arrives, you know, you, I, I can spot within a day or so, there they are on the beach, kind of bending down, picking up bits of seaweed and <laughs> stuffing them in their pockets and looking at shells. Uh, and it's, it's just nice in the sense to have what the script is, is supposed to be about. It's, it's nice to have it reinforced in the people that you're working with, you know. It makes it kind of real. And I think that's the way it should be, really. I think the script is something that should, that should instigate a situation and I think that's what the script's done because the image the beach, the location and the and the cast, you know, are they're very much their own thing now. And so the film has kind of taken over from the script in a way, yeah. Right, Peter, could I just see you standing up where you ended at the last shot? I've never been to Scotland and it's been very easy to to uh, to find the um, uh, parallel emotions that I'm having to the to the, those the characters having. It's quite exceptional here. I've never. Uh, it's hard to believe I'm actually working here. One of the biggest financial decisions had been to cast Burt Lancaster as Happer, the eccentric owner of the American oil company. We went for Lancaster because Bill wouldn't hear of anybody else. So I spent a very, very miserable month shuttling backwards and forwards saying, we can't afford him, we can't afford him. He won't budge on his price. And Bill's saying, but I wrote it for him. I'd written it. And he did. He'd written it for Lancaster. And, uh, and when the writer, who is also the director, uh, writes something for a, uh, a particular artist, it's terribly difficult for them to change it. So when I'd, I would appeal to Bill, the director, and he'd say, I'm oh, sorry, I, I've tried to phone the writer last night, and the writer's not taking my call. I think most actors will tell you that good scripts are rare. This is a lovely, lovely script, beautifully written, wonderful touch of very light satiric comedy. It's really nice and I'm delighted to be doing it. As I was writing the script, I began to hear Lancaster say the words of this character, Harper. Uh, and at a very early stage in the script, in one of the first scenes that he was in, I began to hear him as I was writing it. And, I just couldn't get his voice or the way that he speaks out of these scenes and from then on when I was writing Harper I was writing Lancaster. He's an oil billionaire, he owns all the oil in the world, he's that kind of a tycoon but he's never satisfied with what he's done in life. His real great hobby is the stars and science but he's ashamed to let people know that. He doesn't think that that fits in with the picture of this very tough you know, oil baron. And it's a story of how he tries to buy this little town here in Scotland. And the people are all charming and wonderful. And the men he sends over become, become uh, what's the term? I mean, uh, like the people in Brigadoon. They become mesmerized by the charm of these very sweet, darling Scottish people who are out for all the money they can get. He brings to any part a sense of his own outward strength, but also a kind of a very, very deep, 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 soft core, you know, soft middle. And it was that, really, that that I wanted because the character Harper is exactly that, someone who has immense power vested in him by, his, by the fact that he's a billionaire and runs this enormous company. But there's, a, there's an aching, crying soul inside. There are men like him in the world to a great extent and I think that Mr. Fortlice is making a comment of what, what does it mean to have so much power and so much uh, wealth if somehow or other you're not in tune with what you ought to be doing in life and I think everybody searches for that in one way or another. Cut. Forsyth eventually brings Happer face to face with a character who's found his own kind of peace of mind. This is Ben, a stubborn old beachcomber and a sort of fairy tale innocent, played by Fulton Mackay. I think Forsyth is very innocent in that way. He sees people very innocent. And uh, I think that's the mark, uh, and will be the mark, of his movie-making. 
It's a view of the world which is, I must say, coming from Glasgow, what I do, you would think it would be the opposite, but I do think that innocence has kind of gone at the moment from the world. We used to be innocent people. We used to believe that things were good and that people were good, and that's kind of gone, I think, a great deal. And uh, there's a lot of uh, attitudinizing now about oh, uh, all kinds of aspects of life that are cynical, and, um, and it's very fashionable to be like that. But he has an innocence, and I think he's going to purvey that. It's not, it's not a great spiritual force, I don't know. It's simpler than that. It's quieter. Just that life is quite good. Just that it's quite funny, and look at it. It's possible, it's possible that the track might go on all the way if, it, if we can accommodate four people in it. We might just take the track all the way. Uh, there's a strange period, if you write and direct a thing, there's a strange period where you change over, you become, you stop being the writer and you become the director and it's always a kind of a period of insecurity for me because um, no matter how much you feel confident in the script as a writer, when you when you change roles and you suddenly look, look at it as a filmmaker, you think, God, there's, you know, there's not as much there as that guy thought there was, you know. And so that kind of insecurity leads me to want to kind of pack things in just to make it more interesting. And so if, if, we're filming one, if we're filming a scene and say something happens and a couple of people are talking to each other, it's just a natural thing in me to want to kind of put something else in it so that it's not just a scene about that, but it's a scene about something else as well. The whole unit is, we're like, um, we're like a termite colony. And so, you know, decisions and, and you know, and, and ideas are coming from, from all quarters. And so there's that kind of frantic, you know, 20 minutes before a set up where everyone's input is kind of thrown thrown into the the melting pot and then <clears throat> suddenly okay we'll do it here and that'll happen and that'll happen right fellas can you all be very quiet now we're about to turn over be still please everyone turn the camera absolutely still now please and action well you want some whiskey and ben wants some beef sandwiches with mustard and no salt did Happer say anything? Well, he doesn't want any mustard at all. He just wants the salt. Nothing else happened? I asked him if he wanted some water for the okay, whiskey. Okay, okay. <laughs> the qualities most admired in Forsyth's previous films have been the writing and the acting, rather than their visual style. Drink some brandy, Gordon. At this time, he's collaborating with one of Britain's leading directors of photography, Chris Mengers, whose credits include Gumshoe, Kess, Looks and Smiles, Babylon and Angel as well as shooting and directing many major television productions. In the past, Putnam has worked with directors like Alan Parker and Hugh Hudson, who came to feature films with a very strong visual style learned in advertising. One of the things I was looking forward to was the opportunity of working with someone who's, who's if you like, uh, you know, who, whose visual sense wasn't paramount. I have, to, I have tended to work with a lot of directors who, who were essentially visual directors, sometimes uh, like Alan and Hugh, people who enjoyed content, but uh, certainly people who had very, very high visual standards. What I'm finding, which is interesting, is that um, quite the reverse is happening. Uh, Bill's really going for that element in the film and uh, enjoying it. I mean, he's, I think Chris Mengers would, would agree. Uh, Bill's demanding of him everything he can offer. And I'd be very, very surprised, very, very, very surprised after two weeks if one of the things that the film isn't given a great deal of credit for isn't its look. It's not, right, this is a dramatic shot and this is, we track here and we go up there and we crane around and the light's pouring in and it looks tremendous. That's not what we're about, I don't think. What we're about is trying to capture the script in a very gentle and sort of quiet way. It probably isn't visually exciting in a graphic sense, but, but exciting in the sense perhaps of the early cinema, say like in France in the 50s, where there is a way of looking and holding and trying to get a sense of timing. That's almost as important as the lighting and the sort of graphic content that perhaps we're more used to uh, seeing and doing and making. No, that's got to be the uh, absolute real twilight. The absolute vital thing is, is to have them against the sky or the sea and not against this goddamn uh, beautiful Green yeah. Area, yeah, I thought the sun would 
you know, kind of get out of her way quicker and it'd actually go darker there. See, if it was like that, that would be terrific to shoot against, right. wouldn't it? But if you walk along there, what if you saw in the video? He seems to get light coming out of objects rather than light kind of hitting them, you know, which is which is really what twilight in Scotland is all about, because once the sun goes, there's this kind of glow that hangs in the air. Uh, and I mean, it's very tricky for a cameraman because there's actually no source of light, you know, the, the, yeah. they say the light actually seems to come from I mean, the things, from the rocks and the sea. And yeah, but is there a way in which we can dispense with the relax in the grass and the gorse and actually shoot it against the sea and the sky? The twilight one? Mm. The, the very delicate light that you have in Scotland, we have to capture that, we have to capture it with all the pressures of the schedule and it's a problem of getting the rehearsals. I like this place, McIntyre. It's a problem with getting the timing. And then when we've got all those together, then we try to to record it in a way that, that doesn't make it look like a picture postcard, but somehow you can feel on the film the, the magic. I like this place. The air is good, clear. <laughs> During the shooting, Forsyth must balance all kinds of technical considerations. The quality of the light, the performance of the actors and the movement of the camera to create the overall style of the film. As a director, he's a very internal man, um, more than most directors I work with. I don't know if you noticed, on the, when you're actually watching the unit working, he's one of the people you notice least. 99 take one. Stand by and action. He's a very, very self-contained, competent technician. He's done most jobs in the unit. I mean, he's been a sound man, he's been an editor. So uh, he's not lacking in technical expertise. Um, you've seen some of the stuff he's been doing. A lot of quite long tracking shots. Entire conversations in a single take. Get me a telescope tomorrow. Two-inch refractor will do. You hear that? I want a two-inch refractor. It, you run a risk with that. I mean, if it doesn't work, you've got a lot less options in the cutting room. There's always a chance Jesus. that it won't work. This whole place on it. Come on, Danny, carry that stuff. I've been working the way that I always work, which is trying to make the the shots accommodate the action. And cut. Cut. Okay, just uh, one more, please. That means rather than um, rather than cut round a situation, rather than cover a situation from lots of angles, you know, we just try and uh, give the actors the freedom to work out, you know, the scene in terms of their movements if they if they are moving, and then find a shot that accommodates that. What it really amounts to is that he sort of lets me alone. That is to say, he lets me do what I think I should do as a character. And then he will come in if he's not quite happy and modify it. Or he'll add to something. If I'm doing something that he suddenly feels is very good, then he'll come in and try to make that point to me so I know how to even make it richer, you see. So he does what I think all good directors do. So you know, it's really like with a little more... Seeing it for the first time in one wonder. Uh -huh. yeah. Then I can still give it more voice. Yeah. You'll need a little uh -huh. more voice. Sure, yeah. The most dramatic scene in the script involved all the leading actors, a crowd of extras, and a helicopter <laughs> landing at night. In the script, it was described uh, as a kind of montage, uh, and it was only after quite a lot, a, a lot of kind of thinking about it that, that I realised, and I know lots of other people realised that that was quite a kind of traditional way of going about that but we had to move you know lots of people 70 people onto a beach and they had to look as if they were menacing the man in the hut uh, and in the script they had described that in terms of a whole series of shots of people coming over sand dunes and stuff like that and so I realized that that was actually quite a, an old-fashioned image that idea it would seem like a you know like a kind of film from 1948 or something lots of shots cut together. So the way we did it eventually was to find that big shot on the beach which tracked the whole crowd of people along the beach and then the chopper appeared behind them. So that's how it changed from the page to the screen. You know, it ended up being like one shot instead of a dozen. The thing is, whatever we do, I'm afraid we're going to have to do really quickly because it's going right. to shut down in 15 minutes. Right. right. Even Can you less. organise the what extras you But the tricky thing with that shot was that we had about a 20 minute period of, of light to achieve it in. And it involved um, like 60 people on the beach and it involved the chopper four or five miles off offshore. And it involved, uh, you know, a complex track as well. So just technically, in, in terms of bringing all these things together, it was. Um, it was a bit of a hassle. Right. How's it looking? All right. Action! Action! 
Whoops. Okay. Whoops. Can I start to see the chopper? Start seeing the chopper now. Start looking at the chopper. Coming towards us, aren't you, John? Okay. Now turn right, John. Now start to turn in towards us, John. Keep looking at the chopper. Now start coming straight at us as fast as the chopper, maybe. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Just, the last just the last one. Last good gloaming's work. Yeah. Print a couple of them because it's quite sick, so it's accurate. Yeah. It's probably the biggest moment of drama that I've ever attempted. You know, and I think it, I think it will work. We we'll stick some music on it. <laughs> The film was edited at Elstree Studios by Mike Bradstall, who's worked on many major British features over the past 15 years. I have a, a, a sort of general theory of editing, which is that the, the content of the material will dictate the style. And to some extent, you can bend things about like plasticine, but not very far. Um, if, you go, if you really try to be perverse with the material, it's going to show to its detriment. And as every, every director, every scene will have its own uh, atmosphere, the, the idea is to assess from rushes what that atmosphere is and what it should be, and just play it along like that. Uh-oh. They've taken a church road. It has to be carefully choreographed. You've got a crowd of villagers who are supposed to be advancing menacingly right to left across the screen and are suddenly distracted by a strange light in the sky and to get it to happen at the right time dramatically uh, in, in synchronization with the appearance of the light and uh, where the camera happens to be at any given time on, on along the tracking movement um, we had to intercut two or three takes to get the best action out of each one it's providing an image, an, an image of Harper that, though he doesn't see it, but it's providing an image of himself that he would probably quite appreciate, you know, a light in the sky, you know. Uh, but he's not privy to it, it's just everyone else that sees it. Good sky you've got here, McIntyre. Well done. In this particular instance, we had four takes of this uh, minute-long scene. Uh, and, and in one of them, Oldson, one of the characters, is carrying a suitcase and he falls and scrambles up. And luckily I didn't shout cut. Usually I shout cut when that happens and spoil it, but luckily I didn't. So we've got that and it's just a little bit more natural. And it's, a, it's a little bit, it's a cheap laugh. So we kept, so we used that one, you know. This long. Jesus, Ben's got this whole place on us. Come on, Danny, carry that stuff. Initially, I mean, I certainly think the director must have plenty of room to find his film. As you know, sometimes you're looking for the film within the material. And I certainly think you've got a good thing director plenty of time sometimes uh, a lot of time to find his picture having found his film then yes I get pretty active in terms of, 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 of to what extent I see myself as the person who can come in from the outside saying is that what you attempted to do and the director says yes that's what I attempted to do I say well it actually hasn't worked because that's what you wanted to do that's not what's on the screen and that can very easily happen and the editor and the director working together every day can sometimes believe they've achieved an effect that actually isn't there
where you can either edit a script uh, or you can shoot a, maybe a, a, an overlong script and edit the film. Uh, in this particular case, I thought it would be wise to shoot the script uh, and edit the film. Why was that? Because there was there were things in the script which it was difficult to pin a value on, um, especially with so many uh, uh, intermediate characters wandering in and out of the main story. It was difficult just on the page to de to decide you know what was strong and what was weak in terms of all that kind of uh, activity, and so I thought it was pretty sensible to you know to shoot everything that we had and then decide at the editing stage and I, and I think it was the right thing to do because there were tiny tiny things which on the page didn't really read like much which you know turned out better and funnier and stronger than maybe something that looked good on the page. Apart from anything else a Rolls Royce will last far longer. It is a false economy to invest in cheap goods. It's no cheap. The Maserati is over 30,000 and it looks much nicer. Oh I can just see you getting four or five winter lambs and a box of mackerel into the back of a Maserati. That's what you need your roles for. It's space. It's adaptability. That little scene was, you know, sitting on the page in, in the script, and an overlong script was uh, very vulnerable, you know, obviously. And so it was little things like that that I wanted to hold on to. And uh, that scene, uh, for instance, it turned out very valuable in the film because it, you know, it just lightens it and it introduces all these other characters. So things like that, um, I'm glad we held on to. We we ended up with a screenplay that was too long. We trimmed it back. It was always too long. And I think the film, if the film has a flaw, it's because in the first 20 minutes of the film, in order to make it a manageable length, we were forced to slice into the picture quite a bit. And I think in slicing into the picture, as you know only too well, you cut tone out. You're, you're, you're cutting pace in, but you're cutting tone out. But if you valued the qualities in, uh, if you value as you do, the qualities in Bill Forsyth of rambling and creating vignettes and small characters, and if that's the genius, your word, of him. Why did you feel it was necessary to cut and cut that down? Well, I think what you've hit is the, the nub of the, of the argument that's gone on in film circles for, forever and will go on forever, which is what is a film? Is it a personal statement by a filmmaker or is it a, a piece of work addressed to an audience? Now, uh, the best analogy is theatre. Theatre has traditionally worked in a way that the, the playwright sits at the side of the stage during the what are they call Tri trial runs and run-throughs, and cuts and trims. Shakespeare did it, and every playwright's done it ever since. And what you do is tailor the film to the pace that the audience, you can feel it. Any sensitive person can feel the pace an audience wants to respond to. So I think it's a question of, of emphasis. My job as a producer is to feel out the audience, and I think to make the, the film work with the minimum number of compromises. My skill will be how many of those compromises show and, 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 to, and to what extent those compromises offend my fellow workers, in this particular case, Bill. Uh, I don't think, and uh, this is probably going to cut hard to him saying I've cut the film up, but I don't think that the compromises we've made are unreasonable ones. I think we have attempted to address the film to, the, to, to an audience that's there, and uh, I think it's a better film. Never having had the pressures of an audience before, never having had the commercial pressures of an audience before, I think I would tend to let things slide and, you know, and, and take the artistically the easy way out and, you know, and dwell on a scene which really didn't deserve to be dwelled on. Uh, and to have that kind of um, rigour from David was, was very, very helpful indeed. Uh, and, and I think it shows in the film because I think the film that, uh, that I would have made without that kind of um, input would have been a, a much more indulgent film and a, probably a much less watchable film at the end of the day. They're taking the church road. Maybe they just want to talk to me. Oh, sure, they just want to talk to me. An awful lot of them.
I'm traveling light, McIntyre. One bag in the luggage compartment. Say, you do need to put on this reception. This is just an informal business. But now that I'm here, I think I'd like to organize a presentation. Something these people might need. A church hall, a piano, or anything. I'd like to make a personal gift. You can let me know about it tomorrow. Hmm? How about the sky, McIntyre? Anything new? Well, we'll talk about it later. Thanks for the call. I'm not McIntyre, sir. Well, where the hell is he? I've been on the move for 24 hours. I'm not playing games. Are you McIntyre? Yes, sir. Get to your room. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Gordon Urquhart Hotel. Yeah. Uh, hotel. Uh, you switch. Get the luggage, Danny. Good sky you've got here, McIntyre. Well done. One or two unfamiliar objects to look at up there. I like this place. The air is good, clear. Get me a telescope tomorrow. Two-inch refractor will do. Two-inch refractor for tomorrow. A Ben's got a telescope. It's bigger than two inches, though, slightly square. In retrospect, is there anything you wished you'd done differently? Yes. I mean, I think I'd, I genuinely believe we, we got what we set out to achieve. Um, I'm not a director, uh, and were I a director, there are probably, there is one scene that as a director I would have added to the film, but Bill's reason for not doing it was the best reason in the world, which is he, it was a scene for two people having a conversation, and he said, I don't know what they'd say to each other. Well, you can't argue with the writer-director who's that honest. Also, we... That'll be all for now, McIntyre. Yes, sir. See if they're still laughing. want some whiskey, and Ben wants some beef sandwiches with mustard and no salt. Did Happer say anything? Well, he doesn't want any mustard at all. He just wants the salt. Nothing else happened? Ask them if they wanted water for okay. the whiskey. Stay cool, man. It's a good sign. I'll get the food. Bring some brandy back with your garden. I'm dying. It's been a very difficult scene to write. <laughs> a near final version of the film was shown to selected audiences who were asked to fill in a questionnaire. In the light of their comments, some alterations were made, and a second set of previews in England and America received a very favourable response. The gratifying thing was that the people who liked the film were the ones that could write, uh, and the ones who couldn't write were the ones who, you know, felt doubtful about it. They managed to kind of scrawl their, their, um, their unease, you know, on, on the cards, but we seem to have got the literate end of the audience, which is quite good. Have you worked out what percentage the literate end is? I've, I've actually got more an idea of the, the, the percentage of people in the States who can't write. Again, you see, it's a drift away from the notion of art. I mean, how can you take an artistic product and ask people what they think of it? But of course you do. Well, 82 has been a very bad year. Probably the worst year historically for admissions. Uh, 83 will, by the force of the films, be very big because, uh, well, E.T. is the first film released actually in 83, started 87, 82. You're going to have a third Star Wars, which is opening here the 2nd of June. You're going to have a Bond with Roger Moore, 
opening around mid-June. You're going to have Superman 3. Then you're going to have another bond with Sean Connery. And then you're going to have the Crystal Crown. And interspersed in the middle of all this, you have a lot of very good films, too. Now, will this upsurge in admissions determine the success of Local Hero? I would say Local Hero doesn't need it. Local Hero will make it because it will be the sentimental choice of the people. It is, I think, it's I mean, it's, this film needs uh, you know, a very refined campaign. Local Hero will be distributed in Britain by 20th Century Fox, whose American parent company had declined to invest in the initial project. At a meeting two months before the film's opening, they discussed with Putnam the most effective ways to use their £200,000 budget to bring audiences to the film. And the market that's hardest to get to, and the people that are hardest to get out of their homes, are probably the people who will enjoy this film most. That's to say, middle class, uh, probably 25 and upwards, uh, will, be, will be our hardcore. I feel that the best way we can um, reach our target audience is through word of mouth, which uh, in turn can be generated by editorial and uh, screening programs. All right there. So really it's a question of where we spend our money, and I'm convinced that we should spend our money on what the market that Jilly's already started to go after, which is essentially, I suppose, housewives. I think that, going, that the arrangements you made with Woman and Woman's Own are wonderful, and I think we should continue to pursue that market. And uh, well, what magazine saw you go in for? This is... Well, we've got Woman and Woman's Own fairly well covered. Um, I mean, we're talking about editorial now. Yeah. There seems to be a great deal of interest in, in Dennis Lawson, uh, sort of hailing him as the new sex symbol. Good. And also, <laughs> Jenny Seagrove. Um, I mean, the reaction we had at the screen yeah, the other right. night was, was, was excellent. Um, I feel, in a way, that it would be wrong to pitch it as a young person's film exclusively, because I think it is getting at a slightly older age group. It seems to be appealing to those people who haven't been to the cinema for years, who are coming out and saying, hey, I really feel good after seeing that film. It's the first time I've felt that way in God knows how long. Judging by the reaction to the magazine screening, have you ever known a situation where, given the reaction you now have and know, and know of, that that is likely to turn around and get significantly worse when the daily newspapers see it the magazine? No. I mean, are you now quite sanguine about the reviews? Yes. And the press reaction? Yes, I am. Well, for one thing, the magazine um, contacts tend to be more cynical than, than, uh, than a lot of yeah. others, in yeah. fact. So I also I have some daily could... papers there. Yeah. And they went out mm -hmm. their way to phone you that night to tell you. There's a lot there for radio sports. Yeah. Well, David, I feel that the audience that you feel initially we should be going after will very definitely be reached through editorial. Oh, I'm sure you're right. And sure. through the reviews. Do you want to have a look at some... Should we talk about some ads? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we've come up with several roughs, layouts, suggestions. I hasten to add very rough. Uh, they're just in very early stages. Uh, the first one is perhaps going dangerously into that area that David's a little bit nervous about, and so am I, that if we're not careful and it's not properly executed, it could come across as a rollicking uh, farce, a sort of robustious comedy. But I think it has possibilities, and I think if the work was properly executed, that uh, it might have some merit. Colin knows my worry, which is I think it's, it's, yes, it's, it's I do see lethally worry. close to... It looks uh, like a laugh a minute, yeah. which the film is not yes. a laugh a minute. Yeah. Yeah. You would be attracted to the picture, Jilly, by the reviews and editorial, but rather than anything the advertising would have to... think it's going to smack up against, so, rather weird, with reviews that talk about the film being something very special? Well, you think that... No. Huh? We know what the reviews oh, are going to say, so. and that poster doesn't align itself at all with what anybody's going to say about it. Well, you're say well, what you're saying is that that's going to appeal to an audience that wouldn't be impressed by the reviews. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll it's be disappointed. I think they'll be disappointed. Then they'll be disappointed if they go and I see the think. film based on that poster, not having taken any notice of the reviews. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll think they're going to see Carry On Up The Bag yes. Pipes, and that's it. However, I'll tell you, what, what, I'll you, tell you an idea that does... <laughs> there you go. I mean, seriously, unequivocally, no messing around. I think it's, it's beautiful. It's smashing. He looks like some kind of John, John Stonehouse figure who's trying to escape 
Civilization. Well, what it needs is a line that tells yeah. you that it isn't. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Ascanio. I think the word love is a very important one. The film is a film people would love. And they hate, they also Use love. the word love the as much as The question we have to ask ourselves is that it, it, it's a very striking image, but does it... Does it attract people? Say? Does it tell you anything yes. and bring you into the cinema? That is the. If the people who see that poster don't know all about the film before they see it, we haven't done our job. Well, that, that okay. goes for any ad yeah. concept. Yeah. yeah. yeah but the I think it goes for the other as well. Yeah. I mean, if but we haven't done our editorial work mm -hmm. so far, that by the time the poster appears on the tubes, everybody should know <laughs> what the film is about, and, and it will be a reminder to them. And the oh, same thing applies. It. The same thing applies to the other approaches. No, then. In, in, in fairness, I'm sorry, yeah. you're wrong. Mm -hmm. All this po poster like this, which is neutral, reinforces whatever anyone's view is about the film. Mm -hmm. Right? Whatever their view is. The problem with that, because it's not neutral, mm -hmm. is it sets up an attitude. And the film doesn't deliver that attitude. Mm -hmm. it's quite what nice would you mind. say if there was something else? I find one of the most intriguing things, images in the film, the telephone kiosk. I mean, that's uh, even more enigmatic. Yes, yes. And yeah. half a telephone, yeah. that's it. I, th I think uh, the original image is very intriguing, <laughs> but this makes you wonder a little bit more. It adds a bit yeah. of mystery to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's his link with civilization. Mm -hmm. It also becomes a little bit like a Hitchcock. Mm. Because, I mean, somebody walks out with of the, the birds. Scene. I think half of that telephone. You haven't said whether you like it. Okay. I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I really, really do. I think it's a it's it's depressing, depressing, it depressingly good idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you found it. Yeah? You, you found. saved it to last. You found yeah. whatever, whatever. You conned me, didn't you? you conned yeah. me, Richard. <laughs> I am marketing obsessed, if you like. I mean, I come out of advertising. There's no point in pretending. The first 10 years of my life were spent in advertising. The one thing you learn in advertising is don't try and sell a product for which there isn't a market. Your job is to create the atmosphere and the environment for that product. So I suppose I am involved in film. I loathe the word, but I am involved in film as product. Therefore, I suppose I am commerce-led as opposed to being art-led. Art when it came to distributing the film, selling it to various cinema chains around the world or people who would put it out in the cinemas. Did you have the same problems there as you had when you were trying to arrange the initial finance? No, ironically, um, uh, Warner Brothers bought it for the US and Canada within a week of a starting principal photography, having turned it down as a film. There's a reason for that. Uh, the studios are very, very schizophrenic. They, um, they are reasonably sanguine about turning stuff down on the assumption it won't be made. They become absolutely paranoid once it's going to be made. Because then, you know, they, 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 suddenly they're going to be, there's, there's going to be a judgment made on their, on their decision. So if a film's never going to see the light of day or the light of projection, they, they don't mind at all. But they very rapidly reevaluate something as soon as they know it actually is going to be made. And I think that's what happened. They, uh, they decided it was silly not to take it. So we made a very good deal indeed for the US and Canada with it. So have you, in a, have, is there any sense in which you've already got your money back or what? No, but uh, the film... If the film is a, a moderate success in the UK, and I'm absolutely positive it will be, I think it will actually be a substantial success in the UK, uh, and, uh, and does reasonably in the US and reasonably in Australia, will do very nicely. I mean, it's a, it's a very good investment, actually, because the film only has to be a modest success to, be, to, uh, to do financially very well indeed. So you would say there's very little money really at the risk well, still? It's minimal, absolutely minimal. I would say that if it was a c catastrophe, uh, Goldcrest could lose 15% of the budget maybe 20% of the budget, and, if it's, uh, and that's a very, very fair bet. Lord and that's only if it's a catastrophe. That has to be a catastrophe. For the if it's a, a decent success, what could, it, what could Goldcrest get from it? If it was a decent success, um, I suppose three, four million dollars, and if it was any sort of a success on the scale of Chariots of Fire, they would make 30 to 40 million dollars. I suppose in terms of, I mean, my only ambition is to have someone else finance another film for me, and so in that sense, it's always nice if the win before uh, at least makes its money back. If not, if isn't, if it's not a financial smash hit, you know. But at least it's nice to know that you've 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 got the financier's money back. So, and that's a tidiness, you know. Uh, and so I'm always interested in that, yeah. Just for the simple fact that it's much easier to get money to make another film, mm. because filmmaking is it's a real it's a kind of luxury these days. Really, it's a tremendous luxury to get away, to get away with making a thing like a feature film. Uh, I'm immensely proud of the picture because for me it's not just a, f a fine film, for me it's a departure into an area that I was scared to get into and I think it's given me a lot of strength for the next picture. You mean comedy and comedy timing? B believing now that I can deal with comedy, which I've always been frightened of, and believing that I can work on a film which has content over style, whereas I think I've legitimately been criticised in the past for emphasising style over content. 
Yeah. I think it's been an absolutely legitimate criticism. I have been aware of it, and I think this film's given me the confidence to move on. Local Hero opens on March the 10th. Good night. <laughs>